It was nearly the US's next big leap, sleek, futuristic, and packed with innovations that sat right on the cutting edge of what was possible. Lockheed Star Clipper was a serious contender to become NASA's go-to ride to orbit. Its sharp lines, clever engineering, promises of low-cost reusability, and a host of advanced features made it look like the future of spaceflight, because in many ways it was. Yet instead of flying, it just faded into history, becoming a shuttle that never was. It was incredibly close to making the cut as well. Wind tunnel tests had been completed, design studies were submitted, and NASA expressed genuine interest. But as was often the case with promising ideas, a mix of politics, budget constraints, and institutional inertia ultimately doomed it. And that's all that's left now are the blueprints, a few artist impressions, and a big lingering question of what if. Because Star Clipper wasn't just another space plane concept, it was a bold reimagining of how America might reach space. Had circumstances been different, it might have completely redefined the shuttle era. So how did it work? Why'd it fail? And what made it so special? Let's find out. Origins. Star Clipper traces its origins back to the mid-1960s, a time when the United States was beginning to look beyond the Apollo missions and envision the future of space travel. During that period, the nation, more precisely its Air Force in collaboration with Boeing, experimented with space planes. One prominent example was the X-20 Dinosaur Program, which sought to develop an all-purpose military space plane. That ambitious project was designed to handle a variety of tasks, including reconnaissance, rescue, satellite interception, and even ultra-high-altitude bombing missions. That project went nowhere, however, and was unceremoniously cancelled in 1963, partly due to costs that were set to spiral into insane proportions, but also because it simply lacked a defined aim. It was the Air Force habitually pushing the envelope rather than pursuing something driven by a dire strategic need. Its core idea, the space plane notion of a machine capable of reaching space, doing its thing and then coming back down to Earth, proved to be a tantalizing prospect for US aerospace engineers. NASA was particularly keen to explore this concept in their post-Apollo future, primarily because it promised significantly lower operational costs. And it makes sense too. Think about how your typical rocket used to work, and to be fair, still does in many ways. You got a big, explosion-prone tube packed with all manner of expensive technology, and as that mission goes on, that tube essentially disassembles itself to shed weight and gain extra speed as gravity becomes less of an obstacle. By the end of the process, what eventually plunks back down to Earth is nothing more than a pod filled with people. That's it. That's a hell of a lot of waste. So the logic becomes clear. Bring as much of the spacecraft back to Earth in a controlled way as possible, where it can be reused, and, well, to the victor go the savings. Enter the picture Maxwell Hunter, the man behind Star Clipper. He was an aerospace engineer who cut his teeth at Douglas Aircraft, working on airliner economics before being promoted to chief designer in aeronautics. There he contributed to the XB-42 experimental bomber project. He later moved on to rockets and led the development of the PGM-17 Thor, the US Air Force's first operational ballistic missile. His success on that project led to his posting on the Thor Delta project in the early 1960s. This project sought to transform the Thor missile into a delivery system capable of inserting payloads into orbit. However, he soon became frustrated. In his own words, by the end of 1963, quote, the state of recoverable rockets was terrible. Clearly, he believed that reusability held the answer. But how could it be achieved? The solution, unsurprisingly, was rooted in the basic premise of Boeing's then recently cancelled X-20 concept. And he wasn't the only one with those thoughts. Around the same time, several companies were studying what they called fully two-stage reusable spacecraft, designs in which a single winged booster launched a winged orbiter and both returned to Earth for reuse. Hunter, however, saw a flaw in that approach. It was like building two airplanes to do the job of one. In his view, why develop and maintain two separate vehicles, a booster and an orbiter, when only the orbiter ever actually reaches space? In 1964, he conceived a clever alternative that he called a stage-and-a-half rocket. The idea was simple. Use one main spacecraft to reach orbit while shedding unnecessary weight along the way in the form of a disposable fuel tank. In other words, you bundle all the extra propellant inside an inexpensive tank that could be jettisoned during flight, allowing the spacecraft, with its engines and crew, to continue toward orbit and eventually be recovered. This approach provided the performance benefits of staging without the need to build two completely separate, complex, and above all, expensive vehicles. Instead, you'd simply discard a relatively inexpensive empty tank. Naturally, Hunter was eager to start working on his idea. 
Unfortunately for him, the financial decision makers at Douglas were not convinced. They deemed the concept too unproven and too risky to justify any significant investment of time or capital. Hope soon appeared over the horizon. In late 1965, however, Hunter was recruited by Lockheed Corporation, specifically its Missiles and Space Company division, and on his very first day, he found himself in the office of President Eugene Root, pitching his stage-and-a-half rocket idea. Root really liked what he heard, and the green light was given. Work formally began immediately. Quite the first day. Early work. Lockheed's design team, including its famed Skunk Works engineers, soon set out to transform Hunter's vision into a tangible spacecraft. Initial draft work progressed quickly, and in less than a year, the team finalized the basic concept. They developed an elegant, delta-winged, lifting-body spaceplane that successfully incorporated Hunter's drop tank idea. Lockheed dubbed it the Star Clipper, with stars standing not for big natural nuclear bombs out in space, but for space transport and recovery. By the close of 1966, detailed design studies were underway. These were still very early days, and although it may sound like they were making cracking progress, which to be fair they were, a fully realized and flying Star Clipper, even if only in prototype form, was still a long way off, even if everything went right for Lockheed. And speaking of things going right for Lockheed, their timing actually couldn't have been better. In 1966, the US Air Force and NASA began studying reusable launch concepts under the Integral Launch and Recovery Vehicle, or ILRV, program. This was Lockheed's moment to shine. In 1967, NASA's George Mueller decided to gather all the major aerospace firms and invite them to present their best reusable shuttle concept in a one-day pitch session, the kind of event where dreams are made and careers either soar or can burst violently in the atmosphere. Lockheed, to their credit, didn't miss a beat. On September 30, 1968, they submitted the Star Clipper as their official proposal for the ILRV program, and they had solid evidence to prove it was viable. By that point, the company had logged more than 3,700 hours of wind tunnel testing on the concept, and the Air Force's Flight Dynamics Laboratory had contributed valuable research on optimal lifting body shapes. This wasn't just a fancy sketch on the back of a napkin. Star Clipper carried genuine aerodynamic credentials. NASA, however, wasn't picking favorites just yet. They were still in the window shopping phase, and the proposals they received were a mix of wildly different ideas. What set Star Clipper apart wasn't that it was bigger or more audacious, but that it was clever. Rather than trying to reinvent every component of the rocket, it built on proven, if occasionally niche, technologies, pushing the envelope just enough to create a technically excellent, innovative, and well-founded approach to making space travel more affordable. By the end of the 1960s, Star Clipper was firmly in the running. Design. Now, before we continue with today's episode, you thought I was going to go to an ad read, didn't you? But let's take a moment for a deeper dive into something we only mentioned briefly before, Star Clipper's prospective design. From the outside, it looked like the kind of spacecraft you'd expect to see on the cover of a 1960s sci-fi paperback. All sleek lines, delta curves, and just the right amount of departure from familiar forms to seem truly futuristic. Technically speaking, however, Star Clipper was a lifting body, meaning it was a fixed-wing aircraft configuration in which the body itself produces lift rather than having a distinct fuselage with wings mounted on it. The design choice kept the overall profile compact, reducing drag at hypersonic speeds, and it also meant there was no risk of a wing breaking off during the harsh forces experienced during exit from and re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. That wasn't entirely Lockheed's idea either. Lifting bodies had been on the drawing board as far back as 1917, and their development was further inspired by earlier research conducted by the US Air Force on the FDL-5 and FDL-8 series. Interestingly, the final orbiter design was also nicknamed LSC-8, and all of these just roll off the tongue lovely, don't they? Size-wise, the Star Clipper was designed to be a sizable vessel, about 186 feet long, which made it noticeably longer than the space shuttle that NASA eventually used. This extra length was thoughtfully put to use, providing ample room for everything from propellant tanks and payload bays to the various intricate components that set engineers' hearts racing. Now, while lifting bodies excel at high-speed travel and preventing disintegration, they're not exactly known for gliding as gracefully as a bird. In fact, their descent has more in common with a determined manhole cover. To address this, Lockheed added a clever twist. Deployable wings. Basically, as the vehicle re-entered and slowed to subsonic speeds, a set of small wings popped out from the fuselage, boosting its lift-to-drag ratio from a rock-bottom 1.8 to 1 to a much more favorable 8 to 1. 
Let's put that in rough context. It went from gliding like a brick, which is the kind of ratio you'd expect from a re-entering Apollo capsule, to gliding more like a modern airliner, capable of controlled horizontal flight over a considerable distance instead of simply dropping straight toward the nearest patch of desert. But the main event, the real centerpiece of this little space plane that could, was its drop tank. Not content with merely strapping on a big tube, Star Clipper featured a giant inverted V-shaped propellant tank clinging to its underside like a particularly aerodynamic barnacle. This served as the half stage in its stage and half design, a big lump of liquid hydrogen that would be discarded mid-flight once it was empty. Now, look, jettisoning a big tank directly from beneath your main spacecraft might sound like it would end with a puff of smoke and an awkward press conference, but Lockheed had a plan. The V-shape and mounting were designed so that once released, the tank would be swept away from the orbiter by airflow, neatly clearing it without any unfortunate fender benders along the way. At least that's how it was supposed to work in theory. After the tank departed, either by burning up or splashing back down, the orbiter would continue to orbit using its internal fuel. As for what was supposed to propel everything, Star Clipper was originally designed to be powered by three enormous M1 liquid hydrogen fueled engines, each generating approximately 1.5 million pounds of thrust. This is more than triple the output of the shuttle's main engines. However, work on that engine gradually wound down between 1965 and 1966 as NASA realized that although the engine was theoretically phenomenal, it was one they didn't realistically expect to need. Consequently, Star Clipper, the Lockheed project, not a NASA one, had to find a new source of power. The leading contender was something called an aerospike engine. Now, for those unfamiliar with aerospike engines, well, it's a type of rocket engine that replaces a traditional bell-shaped nozzle with a wedge or cone-shaped spike. This design allows exhaust gases to expand against the outside air. Its self-adjusting nature maintains high efficiency across all altitudes, unlike conventional nozzles that are optimized for one specific pressure level. In many ways, it was certainly an ambitious concept, especially since even today, aerospike engines remain more a promising idea than a fully realized technology. Star Clipper's payload bay it was impressive too. Early versions proposed a cargo hold that was 40 feet long by 9 feet wide, although later upgrades were rumored to expand those dimensions to 60 by 22 feet. The initial estimated payload capacity hovered around 20,000 pounds, with stretched variants pushing up to between 30 and 32,000 pounds. Despite Star Clipper's greater length, its payload capacity still fell short of matching the final shuttle's limit. Reusability, unsurprisingly, was baked into every bolt and every tile. The structure was made of aluminium and titanium alloys, and it was draped in a thermal protection system eerily similar to what the shuttle would eventually use. Silica tiles, quartz fibered blankets, and reinforced carbon for the nose and leading edges. One especially cool feature? Hidden jet engines. Tucked into the orbiter were a pair of small turbojets designed to deploy during descent. The concept was that once Star Clipper re-entered the atmosphere and had slowed down enough, it could fire up these jets for powered flight. That meant that if you botched your landing approach, you could circle around for another attempt, a luxury that the real shuttle never had. Or if you landed at some dusty backup strip in the middle of nowhere, you could just simply take off and fly back to base under your own power. All in all, it was clever, it was ambitious, but of course, it wasn't the only contender. Up next, the rest of the pack. The competition. By the early 1970s, every major aerospace contractor in the United States, and even a few smaller firms with big dreams, was pitching its own idea for reaching orbit and coming back without sending Uncle Sam's accountant into a frenzy. This left NASA spoiled for choice. Faced with making a major decision on a slashed budget and under tight political constraints, the agency did what many large organizations do. It engaged in endless discussions, over-communicating to ensure that no one could pin down exactly what direction it intended to take. The early frontrunner was a fully reusable two-stage shuttle, the classic concept where a large winged booster carries a smaller winged orbiter most of the way to space, then detaches it, allowing both components to glide home like extremely expensive boomerangs. Notably, NASA's own Max Fadgett, known for his work on Mercury and Apollo, was the mind behind the design, an entirely in-house project. Naturally, with NASA clearly favoring the two-stage approach, many of the major contractors took the cue. North American Rockwell, flush with clout after having built the second stage and command module of the Saturn V rockets, pitched a fully reusable system that bore an uncanny resemblance to the shuttle we eventually received. A huge delta-wing orbiter mounted atop an equally massive booster, both designed to execute smooth landings on prepared runways. 
Their vision was essentially Apollo, but make it fly again. A proposal that did tick many of the boxes for NASA. McDonnell Douglas took a slightly different route with a proposal known as Tip Tank. As the name suggests, this design bolted the propellant tanks onto the wingtips. Like Star Clipper, however, Tip Tank embraced the stage and a half concept, jettisoned the empty fuel tanks mid flight while keeping the orbiter intact. Then there was General Dynamics and Convair, which eventually merged into one company. Their concept, charmingly named Triamese, involved three identical space planes strapped together. Two of these acted as boosters, feeding propellant into the central orbiter before peeling off and flying back home, each with its own manned cockpit. Chrysler, yes the car company, proposed something called SERV, the Single Stage Earth Orbital Reusable Vehicle. No wings, no gliding, just raw power and the ability to launch into space and come straight back down, much like one of modern SpaceX's Falcon 9 rockets. For bonus points, Chrysler also included a lifting body personnel carrier called MERP, which would ride on top for crew missions. Not surprisingly, NASA took one look at this bizarre stack of Cold War ambition, realized it was nearly impossible even with the most advanced technology of the day, there's a reason SpaceX has only just started doing this stuff, patted Chrysler affectionately on the head, pinned the idea on the fridge, and then promptly forgot all about it. Some competitors tried to hedge their bets by combining ideas. For example, Grumman floated hybrid designs that included drop tanks and partially reusable boosters. Their engineering was solid, and their expertise with the Apollo Lunar Module added credibility. However, projected costs quickly spiraled upward, and enthusiasm began to fade. Amid all that competition, Lockheed Starkliver managed to hold its own. It was distinct enough to stand out, realistic enough to be tempting, and mature enough, thanks to extensive wind tunnel testing, to be taken seriously. As a result, NASA kept it in the running, even while favoring more conventional winged two-stage systems. In a last-ditch effort to remain competitive, Lockheed joined forces with Boeing for a joint Phase B proposal. The plan was for Lockheed to build the Orbiter, a refined version of Star Clipper, while Boeing would deliver a new winged booster. Their reasoning was simple. If you can't beat the two-stage crowd, you might as well join them. Although the design attempted to preserve as much of the Clipper's DNA as possible, by that point, the writing was already beginning to appear on the bulkhead. NASA eventually awarded major contracts to North American Rockwell and McDonnell Martin, leaving Lockheed on the sidelines, though not entirely out of the game. Recognizing potential in Star Clipper, NASA commissioned further studies, which led to the LS-200 concept, a stretched, enhanced evolution that could be scaled into something more ambitious if budgets and politics ever aligned, and spoiler alert, they didn't. But why didn't they? When NASA called for final proposals in 1972, Lockheed put its best foot forward with the LS-200. The proposal was fully polished and refined as a concept, featuring a drop tank, a lifting body, and a list of optional upgrades that could one day transform it into a fully reusable space plane. Their pitch was straightforward. Keep it simple for now and improve it later. But a refreshingly pragmatic philosophy in a field that's not exactly known for restraint. But the writing was already on the launch pad. North American Rockwell, already deep in NASA's good books, waltzed in with a safer, more conventional Delta Wing design. It offered the cross-range capability NASA wanted, the institutional clout that the Air Force demanded, and that reassuring, we've done this before, energy that made risk-averse decision-makers breathe just a little easier. More importantly, it looked cheaper. Whether it truly was cheaper, that's debatable, but in an era of shrinking budgets, public apathy, and political point scoring, perception was everything. Rockwell's design appeared to be a prudent investment, while Lockheed's came off as a bit too clever. There were also technical sticking points. The Clipper's lifting body design, while aerodynamically efficient, carried its own baggage, specifically complicated re-entry profiles and lingering doubts about how well it could really glide if things went pear-shaped. The folding wings, embedded jet engines, and unconventional fuselage shape did nothing to enhance its image either. In a climate where NASA was being told to cut its budget in half and be grateful for what it had, these features were seen as overly complicated solutions to challenges that Lockheed had willingly imposed upon itself. And then there was the optics. Despite all their work proving the concept, Lockheed had never built a crewed spacecraft before, unlike Rockwell. Lockheed could boast an impressive array of spy satellites, missiles, and aircraft, but not a single spacecraft that had ever brought a human home from orbit. In the end, that fact made all the difference, and the Star Clipper oh, was consigned to the scrap heap. A mere what-if in NASA's history.